second video on the age of exploration unit and again like we talked about in the first video we're going to kind of go country by country so the dates might overlap a little bit with with some of the other explorers but it's a little bit easier to understand if you go country by country so we talked about an introduction our introduction to the unit in chinese explorers in our first video and today we're going to be talking about portuguese explorers as they begin to expand out from the country of portugal and make this tiny country on the Iberian Peninsula become one of the major world empires uh, of the time period. To be before we dive too deep into we into the Portuguese explorers, we want to understand first and foremost why does Europe start looking outward? What are some of the con con conditions that are uh, influencing the Europeans to begin expanding outward from the European continent? The first major event, and this is a, again, we keep coming back to this, is, is a major thing that happens in world history, is the fall of, the, of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks. In terms of the age of exploration, this is important because this severs the traditional trade links to the Far East in, in a sense of how they've been run before. Because now the Far East has an expensive middleman, the Turks in Constantinople, between Europe and the goods that it wants. Europe in the Crusades has gotten a taste for these uh, expensive silks and exotic foods and spices that are hard to or impossible to obtain in Europe itself. So it's been trading through Constantinople to get these things. And now you have a new player, the Turks in Constantinople, who have raised the prices uh, exponentially. So the Europeans are upset that they now have to be able to try to get array around this. So looking for a way to not have to pay those prices. The political centralization of Spain, France, and England are, is another major player uh, reason for why we start to see Europe looking outwards. The consolidation of these kingdoms puts them in positions to support foreign adventures and to bear the costs and dangers of exploration. It is dangerous. It is expensive to go on these expeditions. So the only way, the only things that can support these expeditions and their expense and, 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 and the risks involved are entire countries. It's going to take all of Spain to finance Columbus's journey. It's going to take all of England to finance uh, a Cabot and eventually a Hudson. So these are expensive and so the political centralization that we see in these countries that we've talked about during the Middle Ages that we'll talk about in the unit following this one, uh, we'll see how these are all important things that allow for these uh, expeditions to be put on and the expenses to be borne. The crusading impulse has shifted over time in Europe. It's moved from trying to convert the Muslims of the Middle East in the Holy Land to now expanding that out to the quote-unquote pagans of further into Africa, as well as now the newly discovered Americas, and then you get into the Asias. So the crusading impulse that's been there since the start of the Crusades has now shifted with the discovery of these new lands of unchristian peoples. Another reason is the limit of opportunities for enterprising young man. We, we talked about that being one of the reasons that drove the Crusades. But now you don't have to go on crusade anymore because you can immigrate to the Americas to seek their fortunes. And some of these guys who do this and, and, and have the luck to strike it rich are going to make kings amounts of money. Right? They're going to be making more money from some of these things than some of the kings uh, of these countries for, for once they came. And so this becomes a opportunity. It's a, it's, a very high, it's a very highly risky gamble, but the rewards are things that – and profits that have yet been un unforeseeable or unknowable in world history. And then finally, simply just spices, right? uh, the, 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 the quest to gain nutmeg, mace, ginger, cinnamon, pepper, and cloves for cheaper prices. Uh, helps to drive this expedition that ties back into the uh, first idea as well. And, and again, the, a slow crescendo of concern is being built up in Europe over the Muslim spice monopoly. 
uh, that they're able to hold with the, the land holdings in the Middle East, that the Europeans are saying, how can we break this monopoly or even not have to use it to gain what we want? The country starting today is one of Portugal. Uh, and so very simply, what are they looking for? They're looking for spices. It's pretty simple and easy. It's almost like this would be an easy thing to answer on a uh, final exam in May or even a quiz on the age of exploration that's coming up here shortly. So simple and easy. They're also looking for gold. Uh, by the 15th century, most of the gold that's reaching Europe is coming from Sudan in West Africa. Uh, the Akan people in modern-day Ghana, uh, and giant Muslim caravans are bringing this gold from Niani and Timbuktu across the Sahara to Mediterranean ports. So the Portuguese are saying, what if we just sail around the Sahara and be able to cut out some of these caravan prices that are jacking up the price of gold, be able to get it from the source? They're also looking for Prester John. Prester John is this mythical Christian ruler of Ethiopia, uh, and the Portuguese and other people in Europe are saying, if we can find this jot in their minds giant christian african kingdom we can get them to join up with the christian europeans and be able to finally once and for all get rid of the or convert the muslims of the middle east right again that old millennial view of trying to bring about the thousand years of peace and prosperity on earth when jesus returns and then everybody gets to go to heaven so one of the things that they're going in the idea that they're looking for here now, the Portuguese, we, we kind of talked about this in other ways, uh, like with sailors trying to find more uh, fisheries and, and other things, begin to slowly eat their way out from the western coast of the Iberian Peninsula, where, where that it shares with Spain. By 1432, Portuguese navigators have discovered the Azores Islands, and then by 1441, Portuguese navigators have begun to cruise down West Africa. And they're bringing back gold slaves and grains of paradise back to Portugal to be able to enrich the Portuguese that they then resell these and arrange that, but also be able to intrigue them with more uh, thoughts of what else could be out there. The next major thing that happens for the age of exploration is in 1450, the new ruler of Portugal, Prince Henry the Navigator, uh, Infante, uh, Infante Henrique, uh, begins to be kind of sees the opportunities that are available for Portugal in its further navigation and exploration of the world. And so his being inspired by the Portuguese seeing the North African port of Queda begin to say, hey, you know what, we can begin to use this as a way to enrich our country. So he begins to gather experts at the sailing sioux of Sagres to be able to figure out ways to uh, discover, uh, to explore, and use this to Portugal's advantage. Uh, Portugal is eventually going to start putting forts and trading ports do down the African coast. So by in 50 years, by the year 1500, Portugal is going to be controlling most of the gold flowing into Europe, which is, is a big, important deal, and it's going to make them very, very, very rich. And that all starts to stem from the sailing school. So just so that we understand kind of the geography here, Portugal is on, on the western edge of the Iberian Peninsula. They started to go and sail out. They found the Madeira Islands, the Azores, the Canary Islands, and they've started to work their way slowly down the West African coast. And so they're uh, kind of colonizing of the Madeira Islands, then the Canary Islands, and you can see the Cape Verde Islands. It, it, by going and doing that, they start to be able to understand how you take over an area, how you take over the natives, and, and they're kind of learning on the fly as they're going out and expanding from Portugal. So this sailing school at Sagres is going to help design ships, uh, redesign them, prepare maps, and train captains and crews for longer and longer and longer voyages. We can very much make the comparison with the sailing school at Sagres with, say, Houston or Cape Canaveral in the United States in the 1960s, where the Americans are redesigning ships and premiering maps and training captains and crews for long voyages to the moon and even beyond. So similar, same ideas, because going from, say, Portugal to South Africa in the 1400s is just as wild and crazy as people, as Americans, leaving from Cape Canaveral in Florida and going to the moon in the 1960s. 
Out of the Sailing School at Sagres, we talked about new technology that's going to be developed. One is the astrolabe, and we'll talk more about this when we show you that picture. But the astrolabe is helped to be able to determine your latitude at sea. Okay, so we have our globe, and then we're going to have lines of longitude that tell you where you are east-west on the Earth, and then you'll have lines of latitude that will tell you where you are north and south. Now, to be able to determine your longitude uh, east and west, so your vertical lines on a globe, that's very hard to do without a reliable piece of timekeeping on your ship, which with the pitching and rolling of these uh, ships in this time period, it, it's next to impossible. It's going to take into the 1700s to be able to get accurate longitude and longitude measurements east west on the earth but latitude can very much be determined by using the sun and by using the stars and so the astrolabe is going to help you in determining where you are north and south which is a big deal if you're working your way down the african coast and need to know when to turn eastward or when to turn around the next major piece of technology is the introduction of the caravel now the caravel is a new ship uh, that, that has different things, but it also in terms of how it moves, helps combined, is helped by its combination of the square European sails with the air of Latin or triangular sails on a three-masted ship. All right, so we got our, our boat in the water, All right? We've got our three masts. We'll have triangular sails in the front and the back, and then big European sails. So with the wind, coming from here, there's the wind, right? it's wind's blowing, that's going to be caught from here, but what happens if the wind is blowing at you, and for most freshmen, they say, we're just going to be blowing backwards, but and we'll show this, by using the um, triangular sails, you can actually sail into the wind at, at angles to that, and still be able to move forward, and that's what the caravel allows the Portuguese to be able to take advantage of. The caravel also requires less manpower to sail, which is a good thing because we're still just removed from 100 years from the Black Death. So Europeans still are recovering from their population. And it's also highly maneuverable, meaning it can sail uh, into tight situations and get itself into these tight spots and out of these tight spots just as easily. Even though it's highly maneuverable, it also has larger cargo holds, which is important because the whole reason it's being sent out is to be able to bring stuff back to hold all this cargo. So its ability to sail in different wind situations, its uh, lighter manpower requirements, its high maneuverability and larger cargo hold creates almost a perfect ship for this time period for the Portuguese to be able to sail from when and with. Cartography is improved at the Sailing School at Sagres. We have improved, more accurate maps and sea charts. Uh, this is where I usually bring up the idea of Moana. When Moana is sticking her hand in the water, what is she feeling for? She's feeling for ocean currents. Because ocean currents are like, you want to think of it like conveyor belts in the ocean. If you think of, say, uh, the movie Finding Nemo, where Marlin and Dory are looking for the... Uh, EAC, the East Australian Current, where the turtles are to be able to f z zip them in there. And if you can find where those are, because at uh, in some places the ocean is still on the top, but if you move five feet to your left, you can find one of these currents and it will push you even if there's no uh, wind on them. Cannons are being redeveloped uh, and being able to become smaller and safer to be able to put on these large wooden vessels. Again, a cannon is basically an explosion. Fire is bad with wood in the middle of the ocean. And so these cannons are put on these Portuguese ships, which allow them to dominate larger commercial vessels. So all this new technology and new ideas is then allowing Henry to send ships out to slowly work their way south along the West African coast, like we said. So here's our caravel. Uh, so again, just to kind of different things from there. Uh, so, so that's what they're going and doing uh, in terms of the, the new technology of the ships there. The astrolabe, you got to do some math that's involved, but you're using a kind of almost a compass to be able to find the angles to a specific star or to the sun using the horizon, which is easy to see on, on a calm day at the seas 
of a uh, kind of 180 degree flat angle and then by calculating that interior angle there because we are making a right triangle you can then use those calculations to create to find a measurement where you are relative to north and south on the earth so this is parts of an astrolabe uh, discovered uh, near Oman um, which is one of the oldest known astrolabes that we have uh, in, in, in museums today this is our caravel uh, that we see here uh, again this is about the size of a school bus right so in terms of length uh, it's, it's maybe again this is two and a half maybe three stories off the ground but again maybe only one and a half stories above the water so there's not that many people on this ship but again you're using that to be able to go and hold stuff in, in is what these are on you can see that Arab Latin sail at the back there and that's important for what we want to call in the idea of tacking so that's what this kind of smaller picture here depicts that's pretty easy to move with the wind at your back but what happens when the wind's going forward you're, you're kind of stuck or you're pushed back but what the Latin sail does allows you to use a sailing turret that's called tacking and by tacking into the wind you're sailing into the wind and to at angles into it and that's actually going to allow you to pick up a wind in your sails and make you move forward you're not going to move as fast as if you have the wind directly behind you, but you're still able to go and make progress, which is a big deal at sea. So we begin to have improved maps as the Portuguese begin to go and map out the North African coast. And then as they turn the corners all the way down into India and into Malaysia, and maybe even possibly farther west, which we'll see there in a second. And this is an example of one of the cannons they're putting on their ships. So who are some of these explorers that are going out for Portugal? In 1488, they send out Bartholomew Diaz. And Bartholomew Diaz, again, when we talk about the five G's of exploration, what is the what is some G's that pop up here? Diaz is looking to serve God and his majesty, to give light to those who are in darkness, and to grow rich as all men desire to do. So if we think back to our five G's and we ask what are some of the G's that pop out, well, God is here, right? Uh, again, to give light to those who are in darkness, that goes back to God, to grow rich, glory, and greed, and then desire there. So it's, it's hitting on four of those five G's right there. Diaz begins to sail south, and what Diaz does is he begins to sail all the way down, right? Here is Africa, right? From Portugal, begins to sail farther south, and begins to barely go down and past the Cape of Good Hope. He's going to run into storms and other stuff, and his sailors begin to mutiny, and they're going to go and turn and run around right away from there. So he doesn't get very far into the uh, Indian Ocean, but he proves to the Europeans that the Indian Ocean is not landlocked, like the Arabs have told them. Now, the Arabs know it's not landlocked, but they don't want the Europeans sailing around Africa to find out for themselves. And... The, again, like we said, he proves this. So that's what this is important. But storms and a mutiny force him and, and to, to, to return. A mutiny is where the crew tries to overthrow the captain. So the crew wants to go home and Diaz obliges them. So we'll see this map pop up a couple of times here. But again, going from Portugal, Diaz is working his way down the coast. Barely tips his toe in the Indian Ocean and is going to turn around and go back home. But he's setting the stage for further expeditions from 1497 to 1499 vasco da gama is going to leave from portugal he follows diaz's route farther all the way to the eastern shores of india so again we have africa diaz goes into the indian ocean da gama goes up africa across the arabian sea over into modern day india he's got to contend with arab strongholds at sea and at land but like we saw, uh, this is a big deal because he's got cannons, so he's able to dominate those ships and ports at land, literally blasting them out of there. When he arrives at Calcutta on the east, uh, western shores of India, he's going to want there and demand Christians and spices. So we get the idea of, again, the motivations for these expeditions. Now, he's going to return just two of his four ships and just half of his crew. Right, uh, so that that's this, this is not a a a, a 
clear-cut thing that you're going to go on these expeditions and get back home. We want to emphasize just how dangerous that they are. But he makes a ton of money on this to where he's going to do that. Degama is important because this helps prove that it's possible to sail around the Muslim spice trade and buy the sources cheaper directly from the sources from where they're being produced. Our next Portuguese explorer takes off in the year 1500, Pedro Alvaz Cabral, who is sent to India on da Gama's route looking for more spices. Now, he's going to be blown off course, and he's going to discover the coast of Brazil. So this is pretty easy to understand here. We've got Africa, all right, and we've got Portugal, and he's looking to sail and follow down in there to try to get to this, this India very shortly uh, over there. But if you're sailing down here and you're blown off course from a storm, well, you're not going to be blown across the world because what is right over here? South America. So that's what ends up getting happen here is he's blown off course. And then through the sheer luck of the draw, he's blown right into Brazil. And that's how Portugal comes to claim parts of the Brazilian coastline. He proceeds back to India from Brazil to seek ports to trade for spices. Um, and that's what he's going and doing. And he's going to turn back to India in 1502 to run a protection racket on the rulers of India, like how the mob would do in the early 1920s in, say, New York City. Cabral leaves for... For India, with 13 ships, he's just going to return with one back to Lisbon with the news of Brazil. Uh, but while he's going in and blasting open these ports, he's going to be capturing Muslim ships and burning their crews alive on their boats. He sets fires to the cities of Cochin and Canador. And he's doing all this because when Cabral returns back from India... Uh, he's going to have so much spice, uh, pe pepper, that it's going to disrupt the Mediterranean spice trade. Venice, who's been kind of the uh, the people, the Europeans who are going to Constantinople and buying the high prices from um, Constantinople and the Muslims and bringing it back to Europe. Venice has Cabral's bringing back so much spice that Venice cuts its 13 ships that it's going into the East Alexandria every year for Pepper to just three ships every other year because Cabral brat, brought back so much Pepper that the entire economics of the spice trade is thrown off through one expedition and then setting the stage for further ones on there. So we're getting into the economics of this and we're trying to emphasize just how wild and crazy these are becoming. So this is the departure of Vasco da Gama um, uh, to India in 1497. So he's going in and leaving to be able to go out there. And then again, this is his um, arriving in India uh, there. Uh, and that's Cabral uh, as he's going out there as well. So again, we saw this map before, but da Gama sailing around the African coast and then going all the way over into India. Uh Cabral is going and following that, and when he's blown off course, he's going to be blown all the way to South uh, America. And so that's kind of what we're doing. Why swing this far out? Because that's where the ocean currents are, and that's going to actually cut down the amount of time that you're on the high seas for. The last of our Portuguese explorers we want to talk about is Alfonso de Albuquerque, who from 1509 to 1515 goes out like Da Gama and Cabral. He destroys or seizes Muslim coastal forts in the Indian Ocean and very much by blasting open the ports of Calicut, Ormuz, Goa, Malacca, Macau, and Canton, he's going and pretty much destroying the old uh, Arabian spice network trade that's already in there and having it being taken over and run by the Portuguese. On these expeditions, he's using violence arbitrarily and unsparingly to establish Portuguese dominance and control in East Africa and into Western India. The Portuguese are going to use these seizing of these coastal forts to set up coastal bases. And this is going to be an important thing to understand that by the Portuguese are going to use these coastal bases 
instead of creating inland empires like we'll see the Spanish, the French, and the English establish. So the Portuguese very much are going to now establish these coastal bases, are going to work very um, in step and in tandem with the locals instead of trying to conquer and enslave them like we'll see other European countries try to do. Now, Albuquerque, as he's going and blowing all this stuff up, right, is, is a big contrast to how he's bringing Christianity to, say, India and China versus how, say, other religions do there. So a great quote that kind of underscores this is, while Buddha came to China on white elephants, Christ was born on cannonballs. So the idea is that Buddhism came to China along the Silk Road through trading and through the ideas this way, where Christ is being kind of literally thrust onto these people at the end of the bayonet or the sword or under threat of being exploded by cannons. Uh, we, we just want to finish here by understanding the economics of this. What's the whole point of doing this? And pulled this from one of the textbooks that I have. So just to understand how much money is at stake, uh, we, we can do some simple business calculations here. So we're going to talk about pepper being one kilogram. If you go to the place of production, say in India or in Malacca, Morakau, Kenta, and Malaysia, uh, so you can buy one kilogram of pepper for two grams of silver. How much is that today, Mr. Cameron? That doesn't matter. Is that this is going to cost you two grams of silver to get one kilogram of pepper? Right? You sail back to the oh, oh, to to the Mediterranean world. Uh, to, to Europe. You can take that one kilogram of pepper that you pay two grams of silver for and sell it in Egypt for 10 to 14 grams of silver. So if we minus our costs of buying it, we're now selling it for a profit of 8 to 12 grams of silver. Now that's pretty good. Now usually this is why I ask are any, there are any greedy freshmen. We get a couple freshman boys to raise their hand. Yeah, I want some more money, Mr. Cameron. Let's say we don't stop in Egypt. Let's say we go to Venice. In the spice markets of Venice, we could sell that same kilogram of pepper that only costs us 2 grams of silver for 14 to 18 grams of silver. So now we're making 12 to 16 grams of silver in profit, in essence, from our voyage. If we go all the way to northern Europe, say we go to a Antwerp or a uh, Danzig um, or London, we can sell that same kilogram of pepper that only cost us two grams of silver for 18 to 28 grams of silver. And that is a giant return on your investment. And that's the whole reason why people are willing to put their lives on the line for this. So this is just one example of how much money is out there to be made by people willing to take these risks. And that's why people are willing to put their lives on the line to do this. So here's just a painting of Albuquerque. This is him uh, on his expeditions going over into India. Right? Uh, and again, this is what they're after. They're after these spices. So peppers come from peppercorns, right, which are being pushed uh, off these bushes. So they're being harvested. Right? So we begin to go and we see the uh, Europeans begin to uh, grow these spices in large plantations, begin to assert their dominance over the natives uh, and threatening with them. And we get... Uh, wild and crazy scenes where we start to see um, the Dutch and, uh, the, and, and the Portuguese and the Spanish hiring Japanese samurai mercenaries from Japan to go to their East Indies spice markets and plantations and run as mercenaries and protections to protect these plantations. So we start to see in the kind of the old world in, in these areas, all of these different peoples and cultures and ideas meshing together in the chase for these giant profits that can be made by taking these spices and selling them back in Europe. So that's what we'll finish today uh, with the Portuguese explorers and we'll pick up with Spanish explorers in our next video presentation.